welcome to the Steve's Vector Manager playlist. This is here to give you guidance using Steve's Vector Manager in your normal modded Minecraft experience. First up will be a bit of a summary on how to use Steve's Factory Manager and then we'll get into some recipes for automation. Don't forget, if you find any of these helpful, hit the like button on the video. And if you want to see more updates or follow along with some of the other series, hit the subscribe button. But for now, sit back, relax and enjoy. Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on Steve's Factory Manager. This is the Steve's Factory Manager interface. Clicking on one of these icons will bring up a node, such as the one that is just being brought up now. You can use the little box to the side here to move it around. You can have multiple commands at once. Clicking the arrow will bring up the options for that node. A node can have a name to identify it, which can be set by using the T icon and entering the name, followed by hitting the little disk icon for saving it. To cancel the name, hit the X. For example, let's call this node Hello World. Clicking the downward arrow on each section will bring up more configuration options for that piece of the section. And clicking the arrow again will close it. To delete a node, just right click and drag onto the X. All commands are executed and then Order they are joined. To join two nodes, left click on the connector and then left click on the other connector, which will join the two nodes together as shown. If a node has an error, it will be shown as indicated here. Hovering over the exclamation mark will tell you the error with that node. If you have a large collection of nodes, and they're all over the place. You can connect them directly and have a bit of spaghetti as shown here. However, you can reorganize the lines by right clicking on the connector and dragging the line around. This will bring up a smaller connection point, which you can then at once right click and place, you can left click to move around in the future. Clicking on the this connection point or on the connection again will create another one, allowing you to make a much clearer path of where your lines are going. As shown here, you can now see that these nodes connect up this way. And we can do the same here and here. If you decide you no longer want the break at that point, hit shift and then right click again. And it will return it back to its original state. Another way of organizing nodes is to create a command group. A command group allows you to have a, set, a subset of recipes or nodes without it taking up space in the main area. So as you can see, a group looks very similar to a normal node. You can rename it. To access the contents of the node, click on the content and then left click on the section saying drop commands here. This will open up the contents of the node. You can see that we're in, the, in a group by the fact it shows at the bottom here that we're in a group. 
You can have multiple levels of groups, for example, we can go under here, and you'll see that it extends out. Of course, if you rename your group, let's call it group 4, and we go in there, it'll now show group, group 4. This should indicate that we're in the first group, and then group 4. You can have multiple commands in here, just like this. And they can do a, a subset of tasks. Do note, however, that there is no way of accessing the external group in the default state. So, for example, if we were to have an input and output here, you cannot access the contents of the group directly. However, if you would like Flow to go into the group, all you need to do is create a group node. You can have multiple group nodes, and they can be inputs or outputs. If you uh, so initially, if we just leave it like that, you'll see it adds a single notch up here to connect to. However, there is no output node. If we were to change this to an output, you'll now see that notch becomes up there, indicating it's an output node. And the notch is now moved down to the bottom of the group. You are not limited to a single node. You can have multiple nodes coming in. For example, we could create two nodes. We could call this one node in one. And this one paper. And then we could have this down here. You'll now see that we've got node in one, paper, and our node for the out. This allows you to connect up the items as if uh, and flow control down. And of course, if you connect the node in one, it would come out via here on the output, and you connect that to your next item, and you would also send any output you want to the bottom of the output node. If you've already created your nodes in the previous group, you can drag and drop the node on top of the group itself to move it into there. And it will place it into the node with all the settings that it originally had. To do us a, a, any connected nodes, for example, our connection here, shift and drag one of the nodes into the drop commands here section, and it will move the whole section into the thing. Be aware, of course, that it will place it in exactly the same position as it was, except for the node you moved. So you may need to move some nodes around once you've done that. To move a node out, just move it back to the move from group section here. And it will move it back to its original position in the parent. The basic commands you'll need will be a trigger. Triggers by default are on interval basis. There are some other options available and we may cover these in a later episode. The default though is on interval and you can specify interval starting at one second. Note, while you can specify zero here, the trigger will never run. So the trigger starts the process, and in this basic example, I'll be showing you how to automate a furnace by taking cobblestone and converting it to stone. The first thing you normally need to do is take items from a chest or an inventory. For this purpose, you would use an input. Inputs allow you to take items out of a system and put them in a temporary interface inside the manager. As you can see, a similar interface as the trigger is shown. In this case, however, you have the ability to select an inventory, and we will be selecting, in this case, the chest. You can see it shows that it is now selected by both saying selected when you hover over it, plus 
highlighting slightly in green color. You can also you can select multiple items at once. You can select all. You can select none. You can invert the selection. And you can use variables. I, and we'll cover those shortly. So in this case, we just want to use the chest. You can also find where an inventory is by holding down shift and it will show you the adjacent blocks. If you are setting the chest or the inventory on another block, such as a piece of stone or cobblestone, it would indicate which of the 50 chests that could be shown here is the one you're looking for. So you could use that as an indicator by moving a piece of stone or unique block around to show it. The target is the side of the selected inventories that should be interacted with. In the case of a chest, this doesn't really matter what you select because a chest does, uh, takes items from all sides. However, some inventories, e.g. a furnace, do require certain sides to be selected. Some setups of Steve's Factory Manager require to always select a target. To set the target, click the target you want. In this case, we will activate the up position. You and you need to click the activate button. When this happens, you'll see that the up position now has a white box around it. You can also specify which slot to take the items out of. This could be helpful in the case of a chest where you wanted to pull out the item in slot 6. Do note that in some inventories, counting starts at 0. However, in this case, we're just going to use all slots. To deactivate, click it, click deactivate, and it will now be deselected. In this case, we'll take the items out of the chest, and it does not matter which side they come out of. The item, se uh, the item section allows you to specify which items to take out. By default, the input is normally set to blacklist, and it specifies no items. This means that all the items that are in the selected inventory will be taken out. You can choose which items shouldn't be taken out by left clicking a question mark and searching in the box provided, for example, stone, and then left clicking on it. You can have multiple items be left in the chest. You can also right click and specify the amount to be taken or the amount to be left along with various other detection methods. If you wish to leave all the items or apply the settings to all the items, make sure that match all is selected. In the case of a blacklist, specifying an amount will leave the that many items in the chest. So for example, if you were to specify five and there are 12 items in the chest, it would take out seven items and leave five behind. You can also specify a whitelist, and the whitelist operates in a different way in that it says to take only these items out of the chest. Once again, you've got the same interface, and specifying an amount will mean that it will only ever take this many out. So for our example with 12, it would now only take five items out. Be aware, however, that the next run on the trigger would take another five items out, whereas with a blacklist, it will always leave those five in there. In our case, however, we're going to blacklist all the stone, and we're going to blacklist or leave behind five cobblestone.
Once you have the items selected for taking out of the input, you want to, you'd want to specify an output. The output is the location to put the items that you took from this inventory in the input. Once again, you have a similar, a, a very similar interface. We select inventories, and in, in this case, we're going to select the two furnaces, which allows us to place items in both furnaces at once. In this case, a furnace does have a limitation on what size can be used. The first thing we're going to do is ensure that there is coal in the furnace. In order to place coal in the furnace, you need to use one of the sides, for example, the north, south, east, or west. So we're going to select the north and activate. But we're also going to deactivate the upside. As with the input, you can specify which items are whitelisted to be placed into the inventory, or which items are blacklisted to not be placed in the inventory. However, unlike with the input, specifying an amount has some different effects. For the whitelist, if you specify an amount, it will ensure that there are no more than that many items in that inventory at any one time. So, for example, if you specify four coal and there is already three coal in the inventory, it'll place one coal in there. If, however, there are four coal in there, it will not place any further coal in there. So, let's kick this up and see what happens. So we don't have any errors, and if we go over here to our chest, and we place in some cobblestone, and some coal, you'll see it immediately takes up the coal, but not the cobblestone. You'll also notice that it's taken the four coal and placed it in the furnace. Let's now configure it to place cobblestone in, because you noticed that it did not take the cobblestone out because it had nowhere to put it. So, we'll create another output. And we'll once again select the furnaces. In this case, it is the up position we need it on. So we'll leave that the same. Do remember that some configurations do require you to select the target to configure it. We will now put a whitelist Actually, now we'll put a blacklist. We'll leave this blacklist. We've already blacklisted stone from being picked back up. So anything that's actually picked up will already be in our temporary interface. And we just we'll just drop it all into the furnace. So we join this up now. So you'll now see that it's taken the core stone and put it into the furnace. You'll also notice, however, that it's also taken the coal. In this case, it's put in the top slot. That is because we blacklisted, we said to put everything in this bottom thing. We didn't care what it actually wanted. So let's also blacklist coal, so that it does not put coal in, in anywhere, because that should be done in the first slot up here. So, it is now cooking the cobblestone. And both of them have four coal in them. And we can take as much coal out as we want, and we'll just keep putting it back in. So now, we're cooking up. You will notice it's not taking the items out of the furnace. This needs to be a separate action, much like you would do yourself. So, while you could add another input and output combination at the bottom here, it would only apply if the item is already ready to be taken out 
directly after it's placed the output in there. So you're always better to create a separate trigger and then follow the same process again, except for in this case, we would set the input to be the furnaces, the target, which once again, remembering we are working with a furnace, so it is sided, you would need to use the down position because you extract things from the bottom. We can set a blacklist because we don't care what we take out. And an output to be our chest. And it doesn't matter once again the target because it's a chest and you can insert from all sides. And the items is once again a blacklist. If we join these together, it will now empty the furnace and stick it into the chest. There's our 18 stone. So those are the basic commands you would need to start your automation. Basically, your inputs to take things out of the inventory and where to place it once you've taken it out. As long as it has an inventory slot, you can normally use the Factory Manager to pull something out or to put something in. The next icon you will normally need is a condition. A condition is an if statement. Like, you could go to a chest and say, do I have enough stone? And if you do have enough stone, you'll do one action. And if you don't have enough stone, you'll do another. In this case, if you do have enough stone, it would be a true statement. And if you don't, it would be a false statement. Much like the inputs and outputs we've been looking at, you have your naming, you have an inventory, so we, would, we could say our chest for the sake example. We could say the target, which is exactly the same as the other. Once again, chest doesn't matter. And we have the items, which adds the require all or if any. This basically says we must, for requires all, we must have all the items that have been listed here. Whereas if any says if it, um, that we can have one of the items here for this condition to be true. So in our case, we're going to say, do we have any stone? Any stone at all? Or you can right click once again and specify amount, saying if we have this many stone, and we can say, five which will say which then says if we have five stone then we go down this path otherwise we'll go down this path now what we can do is we can add this to the false statement we'll just move these down a little more And join it up. So now what we're saying is on when we run this trigger, if the chest has five stone, then we're fine. We don't need to, we won't do anything here. We could do something, and there's plenty of other things you can do. But if it doesn't, then we need to make some stone. So We'll take the cobblestone and the coal out of the chest like we were before. We'll output the coal and we will output the cobblestone. And then of course our original rule, our other rule, will take the items that when they're finished smelting. So if we try that now, you'll see that while we've got coal in here, it's not processing anything in either chest. We have five cobblestone and 40 stone. If we were to grab some more cobblestone and place them under here, you'll see it won't do anything. However, the moment we take the stone out, it goes, oh, I need to make some stone. So it'll take all the stone out 
and put it into one of the furnaces to be cooked up. The factory manager also provides the same interface for liquids with an input and output in a condition, and they work exactly the same way, except for instead of being inventories, you're now working with tanks and liquids. While selecting inventories for one input and one output can be reasonably easy if you have one or two inventories. What happens if we wanted to, I don't know, use a few more? Yeah, possibly a little overkill for our cobblestone production, but it gets the point through. Of course, we're going to need a lot more cobble and a lot more coal, but we can use the same rule to do the equivalent thing. However, I'm not going to go through and select every single furnace, because that will be time consuming and tedious, and what if we want to change it or add more later? This is where one of the more advanced features, but very very useful to start using early on, comes into play. These are variables. You can select multiple variables. So we can have, let's say, three variables. So you can name your variables. And in the, for the variables, I would highly recommend naming them because it will make locating them easier later. So if we call this furnaces, and we hit the save button, you could choose a color. Now, your variables are the colors themselves, but naming them allows you to see quickly what they are. You can have a global and a local variable. In most cases, you just need local, and we'll ignore global for a later on video. Your container types allows you to filter down which containers are available. And of course, your containers is all the containers that are available. But, if we go furnace, we could do that. We can then select all, which yeah, we could do on each of these various outputs and inputs. But that would be quite time consuming. And the connections allows you to declare or use the variable. At the moment, all we're gonna do is declare it. We don't need to have anything special. So we're going to leave that as, as is. We'll do the same here. We'll set this to our input or our coal. Coal input. So we'll make this one orange. We don't need the right container types. And we're going to search for chest. And you'll see that both chests come up. The chest here is the one with the coal in it. And we can leave that alone. And of course we'll do the same here. So to assign the variables, all you need to do is go back to into the inventory selector for each input and output and condition. And I'd recommend deselecting your ex any existing ones you may have, just because it will use in these inventories plus the values in your variables. If you go to show all variables by selecting the V, you are then presented with the free option, the free variables are given. So furnaces, coal input, and cobblestone. In this case, we're going to set our condition to be that the stone has to be the cobblestone input. We could, of course, define another. Um, variable if we wanted to, with a similar chest to make it easy to understand. But I'm just going to use cobblestone input. And that's it. We don't have to do anything else. That'll check to see if our stone is in there. We go into the input. We do the same thing here. So we're going to deselect all, show all variables, and we're going to pull the value out of cobblestone input. On top of that, we need to pull the, uh, the stuff out of the coal input as well. You could, of course, define another input, 
but this will allow us to do it on one command. The output, deselect all, show variables, furnaces. And the same with the final one, deselect variables, furnaces. And that should activate all of the furnaces behind us. We'll also do it on the, um, the selection point. There you go, you can see them all activate. Deselect all, show variables, furnaces, and the output, deselect all, and place it into the cobblestone input. And now, if we wanted to add more, it wouldn't be too difficult. It's not a bad production line. A bit overkill, but it does the trick. Let's check our chests. So you can see it's already smelted quite a bit of stone. And left our five cobblestone that we said we wanted to leave. There are some additional commands that we have not covered. However, this should give you the basics that you will need in your own modern Minecraft projects. If you've enjoyed this video, or it's helped you in any way, please leave a like. If you want to follow on future projects, or get further recipes, hit that subscribe button. If you've got any questions or tips, leave them in the comments below. Otherwise, have fun all loading, and see ya!